aside from castration, in the last five years, I think my vet's bill been $400 total for eight to 11 horses. If you're a horse owner, you're like, that's unheard of. Yeah, because I don't pay on the back end. I don't pay for the problems my environment has given them. I pay on the front end to give them the environment they need to be healthy, to have a dropped nervous system, to have a viscera that's not in, a visceral physical body that's not in scarcity, that's not in anxiety, that's not in worry, right? But that's in freedom and empowerment and um, peace. And then the horse can keep itself healthy. Okay, so today I'm gonna show you guys my whole paddock pasture setup. Uh, we're in the Pacific Northwest, so super rainy for all winter, often eight months of the year. So if you live in the UK, Ireland, <laughs> Pacific Northwest, or some other super rainy place, this may be of interest to you. So first of all, we've only got one road in. We call this the barn road. So what I've done is I've created another little paddock here to kind of extend it. And there is an old fence on that side. Um, and then we head in to what I call the hay arena. So this is the hay arena and we have a 20 foot by eight foot sea can that we store the hay in because we don't have enough barn space. We've had to use all the barn space for shelter space for the horses so that they can have enough movement and enough feeding stations that nobody gets injured and the lower ranking horses don't get locked out of the food supply. We have pole barns. This was the original. I added on this one to give them more space. You have to think if a horse is being rained on eight months of the year, they need a good covered area. This is their whole life 24 seven. Don't just give them one pokey little shelter where they can just stand in place and think that you provided adequate shelter in a rainy environment. Of course you do the best you can with what you have, but know that as soon as you can do it, and this one, I had this one built because I don't own this property. So I don't want to sink a ton of money into building something proper. I had a guy and his 80 year old dad come out and they had never built something like this before. They'd built other things. They charged me a thousand bucks and it took them three days, but I don't care, right? I don't care because it's good enough. And the amount of freedom that it gives the horses, who cares if it falls down in five years or starts to wear off? Actually, it's been three years, it's been fine. So, so far so good. Oh, so look at the ground here. This is all graveled. Because in the UK Pacific Northwest climate, you cannot have grass or dirt under your horse's hooves, they will get thrush, they must have areas to stand that are dry and drain the water away. So there's a number of solutions for that. You have to do, you can do gravel, but you have to do it properly. I have an entire blog post on that. You can also use these things called mud grids, which I have not experimented with, but they would be my next experiment hmm. for sure. The best substance of all, which is in this little small area, is concrete. Again, if you can afford it. This concrete was already here when we came. So, but this is the easiest to clean. It's the easiest to get the manure off of. Uh, I would definitely do concrete if I could have afforded it or if I, you know, if this was my property. So now we have the big barn. I want to talk to you about this structure. So I'm going to stand here for height. So you have a small wing off that side and a low roof wing off this side and then this center is a I don't know 20 feet high I had no idea of the wisdom of this structure until we moved here and I saw what this barn does in the summer and in the winter so in the summer now you can see these two horses are in the low roofed area because at this time of day, 
that's the coolest spot and there's the least amount of flies. As the day changes, they will move to the main area because that then becomes the coolest spot with the least number of flies. Oh, look, there's a board hanging loose there. Better. <laughs> Better. And this is the thing, this, I didn't even know how old this barn is. There is stuff that needs to be fixed all the time like that. We just notice it and go, oh, better fix that. Um, and then on this side, because on this property, the wind blows from here. So on this side, it's covered with a fence with just a little air gap at the top. That little air gap at the top is super important. It doesn't let in hardly any rain or wind in the winter, but it is crucial for this being a functional space in the summer. And then this is all open. Because I also supplement feed them with alfalfa, just a flake a day, to make up the amino acid profile on their grass and their hay. So here's something most people don't know. They say, well, my hay has lots of protein or they have lots of pasture. Unless you're, if your pasture is a monoculture <laughs> grass crop, they are not getting enough amino acids for them to utilize the proteins they're ingesting. So think about what you've heard about humans who are vegetarians and they're like, you can't just eat beans and say, well, they have protein because they don't have the full spectrum of amino acids. So for a human vegetarian, they need to combine protein sources to make up a full amino acid profile. It's the same thing for horses. Hay does not contain a full amino acid profile. You have to have something like alfalfa, which is a legume or flaxseed in with that to give it the missing amino acids. And then your horse can actually use all the protein in your hay. So you can have a horse with chronic protein deficiency who you're feeding a ton of high protein hay and you can't figure out why is their top line dropped? Why are their hair, is their hair and their hooves in such poor condition? You're feeding a lot of protein, but you're not feeding the full spectrum of amino acids. So you either get that through supplementation with um, actual amino acids in a high quality natural vitamin mineral blend, which we carry in our shop, or you can add that in with flaxseed and um, alfalfa. Some people feed whey protein. I don't like that idea of feeding cow protein to horses, but people do it and they say it's fine, but I prefer to stick as species specific as I can. So I look for my protein from plant sources. Um, let's go outside the hay arena. So here's another alfalfa box. And then this is a four foot by four foot slow feeder with a lid that clips closed. And you can see this one is filled with a hay net. This is a one inch opening hay net. And what I've discovered over seven years of slow feeding up to 13 different horses is that different horses, teeth and gums do better with different slow feeding solutions. So you'll see there's a lot of debate about, oh, you should only use hay nets. No, you shouldn't use hay nets. They damage the gums. You should use um, nylon webbing or you should use um, a, a large opening metal grate because that's what works best for. And what I've discovered and what I'm gonna show you is I've done a number of experiments to see what slow feeding solution works best to prevent any tooth or gum issues from happening in all of the horses because we fed with um, four by four inch metal grates for five, six years. Not a single horse had any problem. And then all of a sudden, two of the horses developed enamel issues on their teeth. Hi. And so that's when I started changing it up. I'm like, okay, they need different solutions. So even if something has worked well for five or 10 years, Excuse me, thank you. Um, even if it's worked well for five or 10 years, you can't stop checking your horse's teeth. You have mm -hmm. to check your horse's teeth every at least two or three months for sure. If you're rigorous, check them every month. So, okay, so this one has a one inch hay net. So again, alfalfa box, alfalfa box, alfalfa box. Whenever you're feeding, um, a restricted 
competitive <laughs> food item like alfalfa, you must have at least one more feeder than you have horses. Two more is best. So if I have eight horses, I wanna have 10 alfalfa boxes because they will always think that someone else's box has better alfalfa and they'll keep moving each other. So then your lowest ranking horse, if there's not enough boxes where they can actually get to them, they will not get their alfalfa for the day. So again, if we can feed out in the field, we do. That's our preference. But when it's raining, you have to have your alfalfa or your supplements, like your feed dish, in a place that's covered. So we feed alfalfa in here and we also put their feed dishes with their vitamins and minerals and herbs into these same loose boxes. Now, you might say, why are your boxes all hacked up? Again, this is an experiment. So I had these built and they were your solid boxes. And then what I realized, when the horses have their heads down in here, they can't see anyone who's coming. And when you've got a herd of eight or 11 horses, someone's always coming and your head is stuck down a well, you can't see, very, very bad idea. Very not safe for the horses. So that's when I did cutouts and I just got a reciprocating saw and I just did shapes and we cut it out and we put this netting on here to keep the hay in. But as you can see, they destroyed this netting. I don't know what kind of netting would work on here. Probably, um, a hay net netting, a cloth netting would work better than this plastic stuff. Um, but now it works. And actually the hay does not go out the holes. So we didn't need to put netting on there anyway. And this was an early experiment. We were like, well, what if we just drill sight holes? <laughs> so when their head is down, they can see. No, that wasn't sufficient. So this box is put in a spot where um, hardly anybody comes up on the horse that's here. That's why we just left it the way it is. Okay. This is a two by four inch feeder. On this one, let me show you. So again, it has a clip that clips into a hook to keep the lid closed. Otherwise, if you just have this open, your horse is gonna pick this up and toss it. Um, but this is a two inch net. Oops, sorry, darling. Look ahead, love. And the next one is another four by four. Again, a clip lid. This has the 2.75 inch holes. And this works really well. For this herd, this is a good size of hole. Um, it's small enough to be interesting, but it's not too big enough that they're throwing hay out. And it's big enough that it's not damaging their gums. So that's a really good one. And then, so this is this, this is another shelter I put up just last year. I call it the sleep shelter. So we don't put any hay. There's, there's an alfalfa box in there, but we don't feed in there. That's purely for sleeping. They hardly use it in the summer, but they use it a lot in the winter because in here, the only place they have to lie down that's not gravel is here. And this may look really weird to you, they use their manure to create in-floor heating <laughs> because the manure, as it composts, releases heat. So I tried removing manure and they were like, what are you doing? You are wrecking our sleep area. It is not comfortable and it is freezing cold. So I was like, and I hated it because they would get like manure balls stuck in their armpits. It was so gross. I was like, no. And they were like, yes. <laughs> So I leave it and then every now often I have to, to get a tractor in here and scrape it off because it's built up so much. So we let them poop as much as they want in there. We're letting them poop as much as they want in the sleep shelter, um, but that's breaking down really fast because we only got it up at the beginning of the winter this year. So there's only two covered sleep areas. So the horses rotate and they sleep in shifts in the winter. And of course, if it's at all, like if it's not pouring, they find a nice, warm, mud gets warm quite quickly from their body heat. So if it's not pouring, they prefer to sleep outside in the mud. So you can see this time of day, where is the coolest, nicest spot? We call this the cow shed. The farmer who built this barn ran cows. And along here is where he had his feeding stations. Oh, you can see the grapes are still left here. these were like the whole way long and he would dump the hay in here and the cows would come in. So um, here we have another two foot 
um, two foot wide feeder. This has the four by four metal grate. Um, I will eventually, I'm in the process of getting rid of these because I've been doing all my testing to see what they like. But I'll tell you, I've got three different size hay nets. I've got another one that I'm gonna show you. So there's four different feeding options. Some of them prefer the four by four metal grate. They like it better, so it obviously feels good to their mouth. So I'm kind of divided whether to switch everyone or to leave maybe one metal grate in place. I'll see. I'll just keep feeling into it and keep checking their teeth. I'll take mama. Uh, Zeta, can we show everybody what we got here? And disturb your meditation. Okay, so this one is another experiment. I gotta lift it up so you can see. This is a wooden frame that I strung Cecil rope. So this is 100% natural rope and I made the openings, they're, they're kind of, they're five by five. This one actually works fine. And this is cement, as we said, it, it was here from when this barn was originally built. So it's breaking down a lot. It's chipping, it's cracking. It's fine. They know where it is. You can see the farmer, he, he made it rough. He sunk stones into it. So that prevents the cement from being slippery when it's wet. This is not a stabled movement restricted herd. They are very in touch with their body wisdom and they are allowed to move naturally at all times. So things that would not be safe for a horse that's kept in a stable is totally safe for them. Speaking of which, I'll show you this. Macaw, can we just show them this right next to you, love? Yeah, is that okay, hon? Macaw still doesn't like to be touched. Um, thanks, babe. So this is something. They were rubbing on these. Well, this one, let me show you on this one. They've been rubbing on these. And then they start, see the bottom here is totally loose. Oh, yeah. And the whole things were going to come off. So I thought, okay, they want the edges. They want the rubbing. So I created what they wanted here. And these are just smooth edged screws and they're sunk at about the same height. They love this. Now this one is getting loose. So you keep an eye on them. If one's getting loose, you can pull it out or resync it. This is jammed with mats of hair every time I come because this is the best. And we're like, don't have sharp objects in your barn. They'll hurt themselves. No, no. Well, again, if you have a stabled horse who has a very boring uh, brain dead environment, yes, they're going to hurt themselves on everything. If you've set up your environment to provide movement and flow and enrichment and natural living and places where the horse is allowed to own their body wisdom, big sigh from Cobra, you don't get accidents like that. This barn is falling apart. I could probably walk around and find at least two new nails sticking out that I've never seen before just because they came out of the wood or something got knocked off or this happens all the time here. One of these posts fell down. Nobody gets hurt because the horses are enlivened and they're empowered. That's right, mama. <laughs> enlivened, empowered horses. So when your horses and your dogs and everything are allowed to be in their body because they have a good environment and being fully inhabiting their body, they don't need to dissociate. Your horses are incredibly wise and they, you can do stuff like this and they know exactly, they're like, thank you. We know exactly how to use this. Nobody has ripped their skin or injured their eyes or, or anything on these because they know what to do and they, they understand the purpose for it. So, thanks, Nepa. So this is something that I put in because, okay, so imagine it's winter, it's pouring with rain Let's say you have a low ranking horse here and a high ranking horse there and a high ranking horse standing where big mama is. And you get a high ranking horse come in and then this horse is like, whoop, where do I go? Now, if all around here is deep mud, what would happen is the horse would be driven out this way. When I say deep mud, I mean anything from 18 inches to up to their belly. 
depending on how wet it is. And as that horse got driven into mud that deep, at that speed, with a horse, a higher ranking horse driving them, they would sprain their leg or their, or their fetlock or whatever. Something would get sprained, their shoulder even. So we had injury after injury after injury happening. This was the solution. Put in a ring road that's gravel. So the horse can be driven out on dry gravel, can walk around and come in the other side and vice versa. There's no panic in any of the horses now. There's no reluctance to leave the sheltered area and go out in the pouring rain because this is an easy, quick pathway. Come around, come back in another spot. This ring road was worth every penny it cost, hands down. It changed these horses. And you would think, they have enough room to move. Like, look, they have there, they have there, they have here, they have around here. You're like, why can't they just come out and go around here? Because you have to spend hours sitting on one of your feeder boxes watching your horses. Because your human idea of enough space and why don't they just do this when you actually sit and watch what happens, all those questions get answered. And then you watch them and you realize, oh, I thought this was enough. It's not enough. It's producing a tremendous amount of stress in the herd. It's producing continual anxiety. So now, what does continual stress and anxiety result in? Well, maybe you've got a horse now with, with laminitis or diabetes issues or ulcers or, 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 right? Like horses, bodies are 100% true. So whatever's being evidenced in their body can usually be solved by paying attention and then giving them what they need in their environment. Not what we think we need. That's one thing I've learned. I, what I think is adequate, like this, I think there's plenty of space. This is a trap shoot for these horses. And your horses may be different. You may have a herd of retired horses who've been together for 20 years and they're like, oh, this is plenty of space. For my horses, this is a trap tunnel. This is a very dangerous, you enter here, and big mama comes there, you are screwed, blued, and tattooed. They won't enter this area. So it's, again, very herd specific, very horse specific. You have to literally, like I'll sit on a feeder there in the big barn and I will literally spend three to four hours watching, not interacting with them because I don't want to see how they behave with me. I don't want to be our relationship, lovey-dovey. I want to see if I'm not here, what do you guys do? Mm. How do you move? Where are your pain points? Where do you bottleneck? Um, what's creating stress? What's creating limitation or anxiety? And then I want to solve that problem. So this one is, you know, this may be unnecessary, but in the winter, this is necessary because in the winter, the pressure increases because horses are just like us. If they've just been confined to this dry paddock area for three weeks in a row, mostly, they're, they've got cabin fever. They are snarky as hell and they are short tempered. And so something like this, that's like come out here when it's not pouring with rain, but this is waterproof. And I put a hay net in here. This is an option. This is a release valve feeding station. So, um, the last thing I want to show you, this is a manure bay that actually cost me about $3,500 because it's solid, really thick concrete. And once I discovered how to compost, how easy composting the manure is, this was a total waste of money. But at the time I built this, I had, I was literally compost challenged. I was like, I was like the compost loser of the decade and I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't get my head around it and I couldn't figure out why it was so difficult and blah, blah, blah. So I thought I'll just pile it here and then I'll bring in a manure bin that I'll get them to haul out and they can compost it for me. And that's the system I was using. Horrendously expensive, super unnecessary. Um, you can see my other video on the total no brainer. Ding that composting way for horse manure that is 
so easy and costs less than one fiftieth of what this setup cost me to do to pile it and then have it trucked out and blah 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 blah. It's, I can't even. So anyway, you're welcome. Paying it forward. <laughs> my suffering and tremendous expense. I hope nobody else has to suffer and go through such expense because it is so dead easy to compost horse manure. It's not even funny, not even funny. So, and this last thing, we put arena panels here because we put eaves troughs on all of the roofs. You can see on that shelter there, there's an eaves trough. So normally there's big rubber water troughs sitting underneath those eaves troughs, which funnel the water off the barn roofs and into the rainwater collection sites. So with the eaves trough being this low, the horses treat it like a scratching device. <laughs> so they would come in here and, and they were wrecking it. So I put arena panels. Ooh, the wasp has built a home. Show, sure. built a home inside the top of the arena panel. Hello. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Normally these come with um, caps to prevent that. But my horses take these caps and they flip them off. It's like a game for them again. <laughs> so um, these arena panels, if you buy them from a wholesaler, you can get them from a wholesaler for as low as 50 bucks a piece. I highly, highly recommend them. They are the best investment. I use them all day long. Everyone who's ever come or helped out at this barn goes like, wow those arena panels are amazing and they are they they so they may be an initial investment but especially if you don't own your own property they are a lifesaver and then we have them sometimes we've needed them at the very back sometimes we've needed them at the very a tree fell took down the whole front fence we grabbed a bunch of these we had it fenced and what did it take us juliet two hours an hour and a half oh yeah less less maybe an hour and a yeah, half because sure. there was three of us yeah done uh, does it, how long would that take you? And then if you do electric fence, where's your power supply? In this climate, solar's not very reliable. You have to hook it up to, no, no. Just get some arena panels, start investing in them. They're worth their weight in gold. Provide your horses. Oh, oh, oh. Mama cleared the, cleared the ranks in there. So thanks for that little demonstration, guys, of why we need to have lots of feeding stations, lots of space, plenty of exits. If you have wild or semi-feral horses, you really want to have four exits from any structure. Three is your absolute minimum. Three, Zeta just got kicked in there. Just a little kick, but she got kicked. Because that cow barn only has three exits. If she was here, she wouldn't have gotten kicked. There's four exits, there's four ways out. So again, if you have a sedate herd, I've seen a lot of people, they have a shelter with one exit and three sides is covered. If that works for your horses, that's fine. But again, watch your horses. Watch their energy level, their age. How much space do they need? These guys, because most of them were wild or semi-feral, they require a lot more space around their bodies and their energy bubble is much bigger. And their messaging to each other takes place at a much greater distance because they grew up in big distances. So now you put them into this, what for them is a, literally a post. You look and you go, wow, you got a great big setup here. No, for these horses, this is a postage stamp. So again, we're back to getting out of your human thinking of what looks good or feels good to you. It's not about you. It's about your herd. It's about your particular horses and what they need for their visceral body, their nervous system to be at peace. Because if you have horses that can function well and be at peace, you have healthy horses. I have, my vet bill has, has been so low, people wouldn't even believe it. I mean, aside from castration, in the last five years, I think my vet's bill been $400 total for eight to 11 horses. If you're a horse owner, you're like, that's unheard of. Yeah, because I don't pay on the back end. I don't pay for the problems my environment has given them. I pay on the front end to give them the environment they need to be healthy, to have a dropped nervous system, to have a viscera that's not in, a visceral physical body that's not in scarcity, that's not in anxiety, that's not in worry, right? But that's in freedom and empowerment and um, peace. And then the horse can keep itself healthy.
And of course I give them all the supplements they need, right? I give them the complete amino acid profile. I give them the full range of like, cause they don't actually have enough pasture here to forage. Horses in the wild forage 25 to 30 different plant species per day. They can get this for maybe here. They can get it for maybe two months of the year, maybe three, and then they don't have enough. So I provide free choice minerals. Oh, I should show you where the minerals and salt are. Hey, we're coming in here, love. Yeah, thanks, Mama. So this is their free choice minerals. And like I said, their eating rate, their feed rate on this can totally vary depending on the time of year or what their challenges are. Um, sometimes when I first got the wild horses, because they were called off a range that wasn't big enough for them. So they came in nutrient deficient. I was filling this every second day. They were literally hoovering minerals. Um, and that lasted for three weeks. And then they were, they'd addressed all their deficiencies and then it sat full for the next four months. Barely anyone barely touched it. So mm -hmm. this is the variability, which is why you need free choice. Right here, oh, time to top this one up. So this is, oh, and time to, time to break it up. This is Himalayan salt, the pink salt. So they can do, they can scrape this with their teeth. I don't need to break it up for them unless I feel like it. Um, so I will alternate with that. And then in here, I have a Himalayan salt lick. And you can see they do quite like to use that as well. A little, yeah, yeah, that's what you think, Mama. Okay. And then they've got a nice chunk here they can nibble on. And then these are compost leavings. So everything in my house is organic. So whatever's left over, we'll just dump it in here for them. This is obviously they're not too keen on cabbage today. Someone even missed a carrot. But that they'll eventually notice that and eat that. And then. I have over here this is a hanging salt rock this is Redmond salt uh, again just a different mineral profile from the Himalayans so I like to provide both so the horses can um, lick and chew at what they want and then for the Redmond I used to also have just like in that little bucket I used to have loose Redmond in another location. I kept it there for years and they just didn't use it. So I was like, okay, they will, this has been eaten down quite a bit. So they do like it hanging, but they don't like Redmond loose. So fine, no point in me putting it out and wasting it. So there's three salt options um, covered. So no water can get to it. And yes, in when it's raining, they will, the salt will get wet. It will drip, it will do all, which is why these are all so rusty because they're in close proximity to the salt. Um, but it's okay. It doesn't affect um, the horse's consumption or the value of the salt. Yeah. And again, like this was, this was enclosed, this was enclosed. There was a fence there, took it all out. Because for these guys, the freedom to access is number one. They have to be able to, to get out and get out fast because that's how this herd rolls and I know that by just sitting my butt down and watching for long periods of time for many many days in a row over the different seasons because if you do all your sitting and watching during the summer you will see completely different needs completely different movement patterns and a completely different herd from when you sit and watch in the winter especially if they've been cooped up for a week or two already because they they just don't want to go out there and, and they just can't get any more wet you'll see completely different needs and requirements from the herd in the winter. So you have to really do the sitting and watching for, again, I would say minimum two hours. Minimum two hours when they're not paying attention to you. If, if you're sitting there two hours and you've got horses like mm, all over you, you're not seeing their natural behavior. Like you have to read a book or go into meditative state yourself find a way to remove your energy as much as you can so that they can do their normal thing. And then you observe and you see what they need. Look how big our manure pile, and that's our compost pile. 
looks quite big from here. Mm -hmm. Even this new one looks big. Yeah. Yeah, because it's five feet deep. And yeah, okay, so the manure pits, these were dug five feet deep. And in the beginning, when they're first dug out, you can just dump your wheelbarrow off the edge, which is gravel. Um, and then as they start filling up, we use these 12 inch wide wooden planks and you just run the wheelbarrow up the plank, get it to here, dump it. And so when your barn help first comes, they're like, oh, and you're like, hey, this is a free core workout <laughs> for you to be able to walk up here with a full wheelbarrow. And then you get to here. You have to pull in from your core. Your shoulders are back. You lift it. You're, you have to be stable. Otherwise, the weight in this wheelbarrow is going to do this to you. So it's again, it's a fantastic workout that um, it takes very little time for people to get a hold of a hang of it. And once they do, they love it. They're like, this is awesome because it feels good for us to move our bodies in ways like that. Mm -hmm. Right. It's better. This is like when you go to a personal trainer and he puts you on the ball. And you have to like balance and like do things. Well, this is free. <laughs> same training, same workout. Oh, 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 Tia. Oh, Tia, Tia. So see the flies on Poza's face because she's been out in the field. But she comes into this cool barn with lots of wind and the flies are minimal. The other thing that really reduces flies, we have hardly any this year, but the more wasp nests you have, and that's another reason you want these really high roofs because the wasps and hornets can build their big nests and there's no danger to you or the horses because they're up high. And you, I have an agreement with my wasps um, to how, for how we need to live in harmony and no one's ever broken that agreement. It's been, it's been seven years. Um, and, and like when they're mating is when they really want me out of their space. Their mating only lasted for, I think, oh, seven to 10 days. So we just left the manure. Like, really, is that so hard for us? No, it's not. Mm -hmm. You're like, we're mating. We need a space. We need alone time. The wasps and hornets need some space. Okay, let's give them some space. <laughs> Leave the poop. Oh, they're done. Clear it all up. You know, it's, it's and the service they provide. So let's show Pose's face now. Way less flies. Show these guys' faces. One. Just two. So again, one last word on the manure pits. People will be like, why have you located your manure pit so close to the barn? Like they tell you never to do that. They're like, that's a fly factory and you put it right where your horses are. Okay, but look at my horses. Mm -hmm. There's no flies here. The, the manure, and why did I put it there? Because that's where they chose. Again, I watched them and I was like, they're going over there. This is before it was a pit. They would go there and poo. And I was like, why are you guys pooing right where your living quarters are? And they did another one there in those blackberry bushes. Again, right in the middle of their living quarters. And I was like, why are you guys building stud piles of poop right where you live? Because humans say you should never do that. Um, and by watching them, again, don't interfere. Just watch. And I went, I have less flies than any other horses in this region. Everyone else was fly masking and, and oh, where's fly spray? My horses, as you've just seen, were fine. And I was like, this is, this is horse wisdom at work. They put the poo piles close, um, but what ended up happening is they provided a food source for the wasps, for the spiders. There's dozens of birds that come around their poo piles that eat the worm larvae out of their poo. So the horses were working in concert with the ecosystem and they were like, no, no, flies eat protein, right? Our manure has a lot of protein in it. If we give them a protein source from the larvae and the worm eggs are like free protein for the flies. 
if we give that to them and they have their space and they have adequate food, they don't need to come and get their protein from the fluid in our eyeballs. Because mm. that's what they're doing. That's what they're after when they go after the horse's face. The, the eye fluid contains protein. That's a very crappy source of protein compared to a man, uh, horse manure filled with worm eggs and um, undigested matter, which then feeds all kinds of insect life and microbial life. And you will get all kinds of things growing on your manure pile that feed your flies. So again, it's completely contrary to the human view. Humans are like, take that manure pile as far away. But then when the flies come here, the only food source is the eyeballs. Mm -hmm. So you, do you get what I'm saying? I mean, it sounds like a wacky theory and I don't think I would have come up with it myself but they come up with it and because I was watching and I just watched, I didn't immediately seek to change. I was here to learn from them. Um, they showed me the system and it has worked brilliantly for seven years in a row through, and we've had hot summers and dry summers and wet summers and it doesn't matter. It's not weather dependent. Um, it still works to keep the flies as they come on my face. <laughs> Yeah, he's literally landing on your face. Yeah, he's like, you're talking about flies? Here, let me help you. <laughs> um, and because you've got these big barns with their shading, with the airflow, like again, we always try as humans, we try to isolate it to one plus one equals two. It's not. Everything in nature is always a synergy. So maybe if we didn't have big shaded areas with lots of airflow, maybe it wouldn't have worked to put them in your piles there. Mm -hmm. But then the horses probably wouldn't have put their poop there. Right? Again, watch your herd. And the more your herd is connected into their body wisdom and not dis now if you have a stabled, dissociated horse who's never been allowed to inhabit their body, they're not going to be able to show you a lot, right? So in that case, you can, you know, watch herds like this and learn from these guys. Um, but as you allow your horse to and you provide your horse with the environment to actually come into their body, and to reaccess their innate wisdom like Zora here. Zora is a domestic born horse. She was raised, she was confined to a barn with a tiny paddock all winter long. And then her summer turnout was a three quarter acre field. That's for four horses. Mm. I mean, that's what I mean by a horse who's not in their natural body or state because their environment does not allow them to be. Mm. But she has rewilded herself. She has learned from these guys and she has been provided with an environment where she can meet all her needs herself. And of course, she's in the best health she's ever been in. Um, she barely needs hoof trimming or teeth floating. I had the vet come out, check her, she's fine. In her old place, she had to have her teeth filed every year. She had to have her hooves done every, I don't know what it was, six weeks, like her hooves grow so fast out here. She's got the gravel to weigh it down. She's got slow feeding with coarse, first cut hay to grind her teeth. Like everything is a picture, it's a holistic picture. And if we put our effort and our money and our energy into setting up a self-sufficient healthy environment, it's a win-win all the way around. It's gonna be cheaper for you in the long run, like someone else's vet bills, would it cost me what it cost what would it cost me to build that shelter mm -hmm. right or someone else's vet bills would have been the cost of that ring road so you have to kind of like pull back and take a bigger picture and go what do i want for my horses what do i want for my relationship with them what do i want our lives to look like do i want to be this person with continual health issues and anxiety and crisis to crisis to colic to laminitis to founder to ulcers to we don't have that. We don't have that here because the environment is set up the right way, the nutrition is set up the right way, and the energetics are set up the right way. So. Quick clarification, when I say no colic, no ulcers, no nothing, I don't mean that these horses are 100% clear and free of any health issue. What I mean is that when a horse is fully embodied and not dissociated and free to express themselves using their body, when they develop a physical issue, it is a message. And so, yes, we give physical um, attention, but we know that the root of this lies in the emotional 
energetic, possibly spiritual realm. So that's where we go. So I have a number of, I have a health section on my blog with a number of protocols and things that you can do. Um, what I'm saying is that nothing gets to the point where I have to call the vet. That's what's super rare about this herd and setting up their environment that way. Not that we don't have health issues. Of course we do. We are an integrated mind, body, spirit. And if I'm not receiving a message or my daughter or someone else connected with this herd is not receiving a message in any other way, a horse will use their physical body as a last resort to get the message through. So that absolutely 100% does happen. But as long as your environment and nutrition and um, entire living area is set up with what works best for your horses, then that messaging is very simple. And as soon as you lean in, you can clear whatever the health issue, the message is very quickly and it never has to escalate. So, so the horses have had a lot of good eating out of this part of the field. And I left it as long as I could before fencing it off. And I asked them, where should we fence? So they told me, mostly Sione, I mostly just worked with Sione, told me where to put this fence line. And they kept a good amount of um, area for themselves back here. A lot of this is inedible stuff, but it gives them space and room. And there's a, a place to cross there. There's a not so narrow place to cross here. Like with this herd and wilder herds, you always have to make sure they have enough room <clears throat> to move without anybody feeling squished or, or feeling in danger. And then they've left themselves the whole back area here that leads into the forest. And then again, up the side there. So although I fenced off probably two, two and a half acres here uh, to let this get really nice and tall, they have left themselves quite a bit out here to forage around so that they don't feel then deprived. Because in other, in one year, I ran just a single line from the top all the way to the back and they lost all of this and they couldn't access their forest here. Oh my gosh, that was the worst year. It was the worst thing I could have done. I had no idea how much they valued that feeling of being able to roam around and being able to go in and out of their woods, even though they don't go in there, you know, much compared to the time they spend in other places, it was vitally important for them to have it and to have access. So again, even for stuff like that you wouldn't think of, listen to your horse, because they've got better ideas than you do. I have a detailed post on my blog which tells you how to regrow your pastures when they look like this. If you have composted soil that you can spread on your field or your trashed field, that is ideal. And if you've got good compost that has worms in it, that is going to double your rate of growth on those fields. But I have done it years where I haven't spread anything. I've just kept the horses off it. I have no irrigation. I haven't been watering, but we are in a rainy climate, so we do get a decent amount of rain. So your sacrifice field for your horses is gonna look like this. This is February. <laughs> You're like, nothing is going to grow here. Not only has all the vegetation been destroyed, there's not even a root system. But I'll tell you, even if you don't seed and you just pull the horses off of here, this will regenerate and this will grow fresh, uh, good grass. So unless this were, so were clay, you are going to see good regrowth on this regardless, even if it's destroyed to this amount. Now, this is a field that has been growing very well for a number of years. If you have a field that has poor soil and it's been trashed for many years, then you're probably going to need to reseed at 15 pounds of seed per acre. And that will give you just throw, just take your hands and, you know, throw it like this. Just sprinkle it out there. 
um, usually mid-April when the nighttime temperatures don't drop below six degrees Celsius because they need a certain amount of warmth to germinate and fence it off, get your horses off there. Even if you don't put compost, if you don't put fresh soil, if you just reseed at 15 pounds an acre and get your horses off there, even something this destroyed can recover. And I still get really good growth just from keeping the horses off it and letting those plant roots get long enough because the longer the the leaf is the the stem part of the grass the more sunlight it can photosynthesize and the deeper it can sink its roots which means it can then grow at a much faster rate than a short grass so ideally you want your grass to get to a minimum of six inches tall before you let your horses on it and if you want to see the most rapid growth you pull them off when it's four inches tall so you just let them eat that first two inches pull them off and then in as little as a couple of days or you know depending on your climate maybe a week you can put them back on there because they've grown another two inches and that's the secret to pasture rotation is to leave your grass long enough that it can regrow super fast rather than having to wait weeks to get a bit of growth off of grass that's an inch or two high. Now ideally while you're waiting for your grass to grow up you would have an alternate field to turn your horses out on so that they could keep grazing and you wouldn't have to hay field. So my alternate field is at the back. They have to cross a creek and go down there. So they don't spend a ton of time back there. They often don't feel safe. There's coyotes, but there's lots of forage, including plants and bushes, which is really important for them to have that very diet of a wild horse who gets 25 to 30 different plants per day. So the secret to permaculture is to have a number of fields that you can rotate the horses among so that they can always be grazing rather than being hay fed during the summer months. And then to also have the centralized graveled paddock area where the horses come, come in if it's raining or if they want to have a break or maybe they, for me, I keep low sugar hay in those paddock feeders and that means that if the horses are like I've had too much fresh grass my stomach's not feeling too well they'll come in and they'll eat some hay they are very um, good at self-regulating again if we give them the options so if we're in an area where we really have just grass and we don't have those 30 different forage plants the horses don't want to eat high sugar grass all day long so what I found with mine, because it takes a while, but they're not in scarcity anymore, is that if I keep the feeders stocked with low sugar hay, they will self-regulate the amount of fresh grass um, and other plants that they eat, and they'll balance it off with the hay. So that's another reason to have a really good setup with slow feeders ready for your horses. Mm -hmm.